see your cute little face. Today, we're pulling the curtain back and taking you inside the Woodland Park Zoo. We had to kind of go back to square one and look at this exhibit and any hazards there might be for a new cub. New exhibits. Oh my gosh, he's so fuzzy. New animals. Just because we didn't get them on the camera doesn't mean they're not there. And new adventures await right now on Cairo 7. Hey guys, I'm Mel Thomas and this is Woodland Park Zoo. A 92-acre wildlife conservation organization in Seattle, the largest city in the Pacific Northwest. Nearly 4 million people live here. And while that's a lot of humans, the PNW's stunning wilderness is home to a wide range of wildlife too. Today, we'll explore that connection, the ways people can better coexist with the natural world. It's a mission that WPZ is very passionate about and they have several conservation efforts underway right now. Some partnerships as far reaching as India, Africa, and Malaysia. But you don't need to travel far to find animals in need of help. There's even an entire area at the zoo called the Living Northwest Trail, and it's dedicated to the animals that call the PNW home alongside all of us. And it's where we find the zoo's newest resident, a baby bear cub named Juniper. She was just rescued from the wild, and man, she is ready for her close up. Roaming on an Air Force base near Anchorage, Alaska, orphaned and alone. They can't survive on their own. They're just not capable of making it. Baby bear Juniper didn't have a lot of hope for survival in the wild. So it was either fishing game, we're going to euthanize her or find a home for her. So we were ready for it. That's when she got a new leash on life and a first class ticket to Seattle, taking off on a 2200 mile journey to her new home at Woodland Park Zoo. Yeah. The six month old cub welcomed with lots of toys and even a kiddie pool to splash around in while the team put finishing touches on her habitat. It's our job to make it comfortable. Kevin Murphy, WPZ's interim senior animal care director. Whether we wanted to give the bear access to the top of that rock over there. Gave us a behind the scenes tour of her new pad. We are the teachers now, so to speak. So we want her fully engaged with her environment. 11,200 square feet of prime Seattle real estate. We put this electric fence along the top. Complete with a fenced in yard. And we have a viewing rock where the bear can get up on top of that rock down there. Plenty of natural light. This actually creates a really nice area for the bear to retreat. Lots of shade. This moat wraps all the way around the backside of the exhibit. A moat made for royalty. So we've got a very deep pool here. And a private pool, perfect for a quick dip on a hot summer day and a little swimming practice. She's got that doggy paddle down. As far as Juniper is concerned, this is paradise. <laughs> little does she know while she's living the sweet life in her new suite, she's actually learning how to be a bear. Every square foot designed with her development in mind. Well, this animal is just completely moldable and what we want with this animal is to have it perform or express natural behaviors. And so it's our job to try and tease out those natural behaviors and guide her through the process of engaging with her environment here at the zoo. See this fire hose? Sure, it's a toy and she definitely treats it like one, but it's also a teaching tool. Uh, the idea is that she needs to learn how to tease things out of that fire hose to get her food, to wrestle with it, to tear it off the branch if she can, whatever she needs to do, and use her skills and her body to be able to do that. And when you see her sniffing around and snacking, she's really learning how to forage. Most of a bear's life is looking for food. They have a tremendous caloric need. And so part of foraging throughout a habitat and looking for little bits of food here and there throughout the day is our job to make sure she continues to engage in natural behaviors. In just a few short months, all of these things have really helped Juniper to settle in here in Seattle. She's an orphan, so we were nervous that she was going to be a really shy and reclusive animal, really nervous about life, and she's the opposite. She's sort of a spitfire, and she's full of spirit. She engages uh, cautiously in new things, but then she fully engages. And while this tiny cub continues to learn, she'll even teach you a thing or two the next time you come to the zoo. What do you hope people learn when they come here and they see her? I personally hope they learn 
sort of the majesty of these animals. They're amazing. When we succeed in our jobs by illustrating natural behaviors, people automatically have awe with them. And for me, that's the greatest way to build empathy because these bears do things that we can't even imagine doing. And when you have awe of another species or see things that are amazing in another species, you tend to care more. That awe and wonder likely goes both ways. Caregivers even caught the curious cub enjoying Seafair Weekend. Here she is watching the Blue Angels put on a show in the sky, just like a true Seattleite. You can probably tell, but since moving from Alaska to Seattle, the zoo says Juniper has made herself quite at home. While Juniper settles in, a group of tiny pond turtles gets ready to grow up and then move out. The zoo does a lot to make sure their animals thrive in this environment and beyond. And oftentimes that means tailoring rescue plans and recovery programs to each animal's specific needs. Perched atop still waters of Washington wetlands, western pond turtles bask in the sun, poised still. It's a sight you've probably never seen. Come too close, and this famously shy turtle is gone in a flash. Beneath the surface, fast, masters of disguise. So they're impossible to see. Their eyesight's amazing. The western pond turtle is tiny, but boy are they mighty. They're major players in that ecosystem. They're both debris, carcass cleaner uppers. They keep insect and invertebrate populations from overcoming in a pond. Uh, and they generally help maintain a balance in the ecosystem. It's kind of like their superpower, but unlike their mutant ninja counterparts, this endangered species needs help to survive before they can thrive. There is a lot of pressure on them in the wild. One of the biggest issues is invasive bullfrogs, which eat baby pond turtles, hatchlings like they were popcorn. Tragically, their habitat's been reduced. They've had disease in the wild to the point where about 20 years ago, they were down to about 150 turtles. And so the state of Washington engaged with us. That's when the Western Pond Turtle Recovery Project was hatched. We know how to breed them. We know how to rear the eggs. We know how to feed them appropriately. And so there was an opportunity to work with the state where we could bolster the wild population in our own facilities. A conservation effort giving turtles a head start in life by head starting them in the lab. So what the state decided to do was collect a certain percentage of eggs from the wild, bring them to us. We grow them to a size where they can't be swallowed by a bullfrog. We got to see the entire process firsthand. Turtle nests along the banks carefully dug out, brushing away dirt, gently grabbing eggs one at a time to be swabbed, recorded and collected. Back at Woodland Park Zoo, the turtles make their way into the world. Granted, it, it takes a while for them to come out of their shells. They're about the size of a quarter, but as the saying goes, big things often have small beginnings. Hi, little bud. You ready? I need to see your cute little face. Once they have their little yellow name tag, they're moved into their first room. That's where the snacks keep coming. Then come spring, they move to the big tanks outside for a little fresh air and some sunshine. These guys were held back because they were a little on the small side. This little guy. Just like you, they keep track of how big they're getting, seeing how much they've grown and how much they weigh. Then once they tip the scales at 50 grams, they're officially ready to go home. All of that work leading up to this, a magical moment every year when the turtles are released with a new lease on life. Just watching individuals handle turtles and put them into the wild and watching them swim off and hide immediately and then you can't find them again, that's pretty rewarding. Because you're like, I did that. Yeah. Pond turtles are considered endangered here in Washington State. Just 20 years ago, there were only about 150 of them. But now, thanks to the zoo's efforts, the state believes there are nearly 2,000. You could call it a species reintroduction success story, but that's just one conservation method. And remember, there's not a one size fits all approach. Scientists say before they can start any conservation effort, step one, research. When we come back, we go on an adventure off zoo grounds and into a forest where a small carnivore in the weasel family has scientists trying to solve a mystery. We're taking you on a four hour trek into the mountains to see if they found anything. But first, the scientific name for the weasel family is Mustelidae. That includes ferrets, badgers, even otters. <laughs> Mustelidae are pretty cool, so much so there's a superhero named after a species in the family. Can you guess which one it is? We'll let you know if you were right when we come back.
Welcome back. A moment ago, we asked you to flex your superhero knowledge. Were you able to figure it out? Here's a hint. Hugh Jackman actually played this character in the mega popular movie franchise. That's right, the answer is B, Wolverine. Can you believe it? The popular mutant Marvel character is based on an animal in the weasel family. Okay, okay, let's keep moving. We've got a bit of traveling to do for this next species. While Wolverine brings in big bucks at the box office, there's a lesser known species in the family that researchers would love to catch on camera, but doing so requires quite the trek. Just a two hour drive from Seattle, we find ourselves in the Olympic National Forest for a conservation project at Lena Lake Trail. It's kind of like a treasure hunt. We're checking our last survey station for the year. Starting on a journey. We're hopeful as always. Ready for an adventure. It's a long shot, but this is how science works incrementally. An uphill climb full of rocky terrain and switchbacks. Quite literally going over the river and through the woods. A four hour trek to a trail camera. There it is. Just hoping it caught a glimpse of their treasure, a Martin. Initially, we thought, gosh, are there any left? A member of the weasel family, once native to the area, now rarely seen. During the 1800s and into the 1900s, they were trapped, like many species, until they were pretty much mostly gone, especially in the lowlands. We think that there might be pockets of Martins in the higher elevations that have hung on. We need to find out more about where they live and where they actually are and what we might be able to do to help the population. U.S. Fish and Wildlife has been monitoring these tiny carnivores for decades, in total capturing just nine Martins in 50 years. And we were using remote camera technology and and bait and, and kind of stuff that had been used for a long time. But again, we weren't able to leave the stations up for very long due to access and winter conditions. Then in 2017, the agency teamed up with Woodland Park Zoo and everything changed. But when the zoo came in and there was suddenly this technology that propelled us light years ahead, that is when things really took off in a big way. Bringing in a fresh perspective, expertise, and this, a first of its kind automated scent lure developed by Woodland Park Zoo and Microsoft Research. This gets bolted to a tree at about 12 feet. And then once a day or once every other day, depending on its how it's programmed, a little bit of liquid comes out of this. The device allowing them to not only photograph, but attract the Martins all year long. It really has enabled us, it's kind of pulled back a veil on where we can actually survey for the species. The result, 16 Martins spotted in just five years. It's actually working that we're able to put the cameras in areas, leave them up for a long period of time, and we're able to get animals coming in, at least in some locations. As the seasons change, the cameras keep snapping, capturing hundreds and hundreds of photos at each site. Got it. How many photos? All right, drum roll, please. Here we go. Only 481. Then, after a year, they hike back. Oh, coming in, coming yeah. in. Oh, uh, rolling. Uh, Whoa. Squirrel? Squirrel. Okay. Well, <laughs> well right. Fisher. Yeah. Fisher, Black. bear, woodpecker, squirrel. Anything else? Nope. Mm -hmm. I think that was it. Most cameras come up empty handed. Just because we didn't get them on the camera doesn't mean they're not there. But it only takes one to make years of work come to life. We all at the same time exclaimed, Martin! A split second, a handful of photos marking a historic moment. The first time a Martin has ever been spotted in the Olympic National Forest. This is a hopeful story. This is an animal that really we don't know a whole lot about and that have been rarely sighted in this area. Now we know they're here and they're doing their part to try to recover in this area to try to keep going. So we want to do our part to make sure that they're being carefully watched and monitored and hopefully recovered. So by 2024, after a few more years of monitoring, they'll have a better idea of what they need to do to help the Martin population here in the Olympic Peninsula. On the other side of the break, we take an even farther journey to the Oregon coast. That's where the zoo is trying to reintroduce yet another species into the wild. Every animal is here for a reason and every species is important in its own way. Plus, we visit a garden at the zoo, generating a lot of buzz. But before we go, let's test your zoo knowledge. How much do you know about honeybees? You probably know colonies only have one queen and they're responsible for laying all the eggs. But do you know how many eggs queen bees lay in a day? Stick around to find out.
From Seattle to Oregon's coast, welcome to the Nestucca Bay National Wildlife Refuge. For years, this was home to the silver spot butterfly, and now Woodland Park Zoo is on a mission to bring them back. We got to tag along on their conservation efforts. Going off the beaten path through tall grass, flowers, and brush. We're going to have fun today. With coolers in tow, this team from Woodland Park Zoo and U.S. Fish and Wildlife quite literally carrying the weight of a species. Inside, precious cargo. This is number eight. 300 cocoons representing 300 chances for the threatened Oregon silver spot butterfly to once again spread its wings and fly in this restored prairie. So they had been here at one point historically, then they were not here at all for some amount of time. So now we're bringing back some butterflies to this area, reintroducing them. So we want to see them fly free and be real butterflies and make more butterflies and hopefully get a foothold in reestablishing their population in this area. Each box of pupa is placed into these specially prepared tents. They will turn into butterflies in these eclosion tents, as they're called. Add in some food. Want to make sure that there's nectar resources inside the tent. Water. So that way the butterflies, when they hatch, they can stay hydrated. Yeah. And a little bit of shade. Here we go. And you get the perfect place. That's it. All set up. For these little guys to a close or hatch in just a few short weeks. Each one of these is hope for the species. Oh, I see one wiggling actually right now. That's really, really very helpful. <laughs> When you think about changing the world, it really is amazing to say, hey, I helped put this animal who wasn't here before back here. You're literally changing the world one butterfly at a time. One butterfly at a time, yeah. I guess you could say it's a true butterfly effect. And when you see one, it may just give you butterflies. This restored prairie is open to the public and free to visit. So bring the family and see if you can spot a silver spot. All right, now let's head back to Woodland Park Zoo. Keep in mind, though, you do not need to drive hundreds of miles to experience the beauty of butterflies. Instead, you can come to Molbach's Butterfly Garden at Woodland Park Zoo. There are hundreds here that will fly around you, but as you can see, no butterflies right now. So pro tip, make sure you check the website because they are seasonal. Now, a little bit ago, we asked you about another insect, the bee. Worker bees have a reputation for being busy, but queen bees have a lot to do too. According to the USDA, on average, the queen lays 1,000 to 2,000 eggs every day. They can live up to five years, so that's potentially more than a million eggs in her lifetime. So if you guessed C, you're correct. It's a good thing, too, because we need honeybees. Just like butterflies, bees fertilize plants, and they play a critical role in our ecosystem. There's a name for creatures that do this. They're called pollinators, and there are many different kinds, including bats, hummingbirds, even some small mammals. The types of pollinators you'll see depend on the plants growing around you. At Woodland Park Zoo's Pollinator Patio, it's kind of like an all-you-can-eat buffet with a little something for everyone. This is an interesting one. This is flowering tobacco. Taking a spin around the pollinator garden at Woodland Park Zoo. They're pollinated by moths at night. You'll see dozens of plants. And of course, rosemary is a very common thing. Some you've probably seen before. This is one we get lots of questions about. Now this one's poisonous. This is a member of the nightshade family. And some you definitely haven't. Perfect, wonderful hummingbird flowers. All with one thing in common. It's easy for a pollinator to get to this plant and literally walk from flower to flower to get what it needs. They serve as a pollinator's paradise. A lot of butterflies would like that. The plants we grow here, we've chosen those plants to address the various pollinators. It's just that diversity, a diversity of types of flowers, colors of flowers, and elevation of flowers. The various plants attracting everything from bees to beetles, butterflies to flies, even moths. So they just sort of go from flower to flower to flower, inadvertently dropping pollen off and picking new pollen up. So the plants are very much using the animals as their agents, so to speak. It's a symbiotic relationship. It is. They couldn't survive without each other. The insects need the flowers for their food, and the plants need the insects for pollinators. Take a look at this pollinator. It almost looks like he's dancing. With every step, you can see all of that golden goodness building up on its legs. They have a role to play. And just like that, this busy bee is on to the next, fertilizing flowers along the way. It's just doing its work. By helping provide food or and water and or shelter, the populations can continue and do the important they, work that they do by helping the plant life on this planet reproduce because without the plants, we wouldn't be here. There'd be no oxygen. And it's very gratifying that you're helping, that you're making a difference.
Woodland Park Zoo's pollinator garden is big enough to stroll through, and you definitely should because it's gorgeous. But the zoo says you don't need to go big to make a huge difference. You can create your own pollinator garden wherever you live. You can do this. You really can. And if you try and you fail, try again. Or if you're at the zoo, ask any of the gardeners. We'll be happy to tell you exactly what you can do. If you're interested in making your own, here's what you can do. First, plant several different types of flowers. You'll also need some water. Adding a little shelter gives pollinators a place to hide and reproduce. That can be as simple as a dense bush, or you can actually buy an insect hotel. And finally, most pollinators are cold-blooded, so giving them a basking place allows them to warm up so they can fly around and keep on pollinating. So you follow this advice, you're going to be in good company. And you can trust that they know what they're doing because they even helped create a pollinator garden at the state capitol in Olympia. Isn't it great to be here dedicating America's first pollinator garden? It was just unveiled in June and anyone can visit seven days a week. Let's be real here though, pollinator gardens don't just support a healthy ecosystem, which scientists emphasize they do. They're also a great way to just kind of sit back, relax and enjoy yourself. Part of what makes the Pacific Northwest so wonderful is our proximity to nature. Nature isn't just all around us, it's part of who we are. Nature is abundant here in the Northwest, but people are also abundant, and that into the future, people and nature are going to have to coexist. That's all we have time for, but there is still so much more to learn. You can find more episodes of Wildlife, a look inside Woodland Park Zoo on Cairo7.com slash zoo. There you'll see how animals participate in their own health care and even check out the day in the life of a keeper. Thanks for watching.